Good evening. I'm David Conan, going to talk about the forgotten Iowans of the Civil War. Strong Iowa men standing shoulder to shoulder in the ranks of the Union Army, loyal to a fault. This is a popular picture of Iowa during the Civil War. The reality is a bit more complicated. I have documented 76 Iowa residents who left that state and served the Confederacy. They entered every branch of the Confederate military, and one Iowa resident is listed on the honor roll, the Confederacy's highest recognition of valor in battle. These men were a drop in the bucket, statistical outliers compared with some 76,500 Iowans who served the Union. And yet, Iowa Confederates could be called shadow images or doppelgangers of their Union counterparts. Iowa Confederates included students, farmers, clerks, merchants, lawyers, doctors, druggists, a printer, a newspaper editor, and two Iowa State legislators. My book is part of a trend that looks at people in the North and South that fought outside their geographic origin. Historian Richard Nelson Current, author of Lincoln's Loyalists, estimates that 100,000 Southerners fought for the Union. Current calls Southerners who entered the Union Army the forgotten men of the Civil War. Iowa Confederates are the forgotten Iowans of the Civil War. Many Southerners and some Iowans thought that if Lincoln truly had wanted to restore the Union, he was a fool to call out the militia, make war, and blockade the ports. One Southerner stated that the annals of the world furnish no instance of so groundless a war, but as our nation will have it, if no peace can be made, let us fight like men for our own firesides. This raises the question. Why would an Iowa resident fight to defend someone else's fireside? Later in this presentation, we will explore three main motives. Because my, my book broke new ground, I needed to define the term Iowa resident. These are my parameters. A soldier needed to have lived in Iowa before the Civil War for at least two years, no earlier than 1850, and he needed to be 13 or older during residency. I picked the year 1850 as the earliest date because it was after Iowa had become a state. And although many future Confederates, including Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis had served in the US Army in the Iowa Territory, no one would accept Lee and Davis as Iowa Confederates. Regarding age for residency, some people claim Confederate General Lawrence Sullivan Sull Ross, who was born in Bentonsport in 1838. But his parents took him and moved to Texas when Ross was one or two years old, and he had no conception, conception or memory of Iowa as a distinct place. I chose the age of 13 as the earliest marker for Iowa residency because of the increased self-awareness that typically accompanies the onset of what we now call the teenage years. 13 might reasonably be an age where young men can begin to identify with a specific town set in a specific state. Let's talk about ages of enlistment. Iowa Confederates were mostly young men when they enlisted, as you can see on this graph. As you see on the graph, the greatest number of Iowa Confederates at enlistment were between 21 and 25 years old. I'd like to turn to branches of service. As I have mentioned, Iowa residents entered every branch of the Confederate service. This pie chart shows that the largest number of Iowa Confederates served in the infantry marked with light blue. Cavalry marked with purple was a close second, followed by artillery, which is a tan, light tan color. Diminishing numbers of Iowans served in the Confederate ser Civil Service marked with very light blue and only for part of the war. One Iowan ran an armory marked in dark, dark purple. One was an, was an aide de camp to a Confederate governor tasked with quelling rebellious Unionists. And one man divided his service between the Confederate Army and the Confederate Navy. Now, let's turn to the subject of motives. It is very difficult to discern motives of people who we know well 
people we can observe, talk to, and question. How then can we discern motives after 150 years? I think this question has not been explored enough. Historian Matthew Gallman wrote in 1994 that men on both sides enlisted out of patriotic enthusiasm, the lure of adventure, and the urge for vengeance. Historian Reed Mitchell focused in 1988 on Northern soldiers' devotion to union and liberty. James McPherson reinforced this idea in his wonderful book, For Cause and Comrades. Historian William Marvel challenges us to rethink these notions in his 2018 book, Lincoln's Mercenaries, Economic Motivation Among Union Soldiers During the Civil War. Marvel draws upon, quote, extensive statistical research and concentrated study of individual circumstances. I will be discussing Marvel later in the presentation. James McPherson drew upon the diaries and letters of 1,076 men, Union and Confederate. He said that soldiers' diaries and letters got closer to the soldiers' actual motivations than did accounts published after the war. I agree with McPherson on this. However, I didn't have access to diaries and letters of all Iowa Confederates. Nonetheless, I wanted the richest possible sources of data to create a multifaceted portrait of each soldier. Besides diaries and letters, I drew upon census records, Confederate service records, newspaper editorials and articles, regimental histories, county histories, real estate records, lawsuits, pension applications, and reminiscences. Some descendants shared letters, photographs, and family stories. The amount of data on each soldier ranged from vast to sparse. I always tried to put the data in context of each man's life as well as state, regional, and national events. When I had vast amounts of information about a soldier, I heavily weighted his own comments on why he enlisted or the circumstances of enlisting. This was especially true if the soldier made the comments around the time that he enlisted or during the war. Later statements called for greater scrutiny, especially if the soldier had suffered in a POW camp. Sparse data, on the other hand, required longer reflection and a greater consideration of context. For each soldier, regardless of the amount of data, I asked, does the data suggest a readily apparent motive for Confederate service? And if not, is there a discernible and plausible motive? I asked approximately 39 questions about each Iowa Confederate based on the data that I had. Sometimes the answers led to other questions. If you would like to have a list of my questions, please send me an email to this address that you see on the screen. Before I discuss Iowa Confederates' motives, we need to look at the financial panic of 1857. William Marvel states that the panic cost, caused a deep recession in the industrialized Northeast, resulting in market disruptions and a widespread currency crisis. In contrast, the South rebounded rather quickly. In early 1861, Marvel states, there were hundreds of thousands of unemployed, destitute men scattered across the United States. When the country ram ramped up for war, these men needed a paycheck and many of them found it in the Union Army. Marvel argues that most Union soldiers in 1861 and through the end of the war were drawn from the poorer echelons of American society, and he argues that economic influences had a great deal to do with bringing them into the Army. Marvel admits that patriotic ardor, an adventuresome spirit, and visions of daring do surely did lure many Union recruits, but he states, the desire for economic relief and economic opportunity or a financial windfall often provided the initial impetus or the overriding motive. He adds, it was understandably rare for a man to admit that he had enlisted because he needed the money. This leads to the subject of motives for Iowans to serve the Confederacy. Some were interconnected, 
The data shows that the most common motive was opportunism, often related to earning a living with little regard for principles or consequences. Two thirds of Iowa Confederates had this motive. During the financial panic of 1857, many future Iowa Confederates moved south seeking a job. Once they were south on the chessboard, they encountered many Southern influences, Southern bells, Southern friends, employers, newspapers, politicians, etc. When war broke out, they still wanted a paycheck and they enlisted. It is helpful to remember that many Iowa Confederates were young men and they loved adventure. For example, William H. Wall was a midshipman at the Naval Academy at Annapolis, but he dreamed of a career in business. He thought it would be much better than serving on a ship. So he resigned from Annapolis and returned to New London, Iowa to work as a clerk as the panic of 1857 was intensifying. It turns out this was a very bad move. A year later, he tried to get reinstated at the Naval Academy, but there were no openings. So he moved to Mississippi looking for a job. He quickly made political contacts and local residents asked new president Jefferson Davis to give Wall an appointment in the Confederate Army. Wall told a Confederate senator that he wanted to be a career officer in the Army or the Navy, and Wall became a lieutenant in the Confederate Navy. If we consider a different Iowan, James Ramsey Moore, we see a different wrinkle in opportunism. James was a mediocre college student in Pennsylvania. He went to Keokuk, Iowa to apprentice with his successful uncle, Dr. Joseph C. Hughes, Dean of the College of Physicians and Surgeons. James flourished. Prior to completing his medical degree, James moved to Mississippi to practice medicine and live near his sister and her husband. James was amazingly successful with patients. So a hospital hired him and he finished his medical degree in Louisiana. After the war broke out, the Confederate Army recruited him as an assistant surgeon. Other Iowans had different circumstances. For instance, newlywed John Shipley was out of work when he took his wife, Nancy, from Muscatine, Iowa to Memphis in 1860. She conceived as tensions were heating up and he sent her back to Muscatine to her parents' home to sit out the war. He remained in Tennessee and became a Confederate quartermaster. Sometimes Iowa parents looked for opportunities to help their children. One example was former Iowa Governor Stephen Hempstead. He wanted his son Junius to receive a good civil and military education at West Point, but there were no vacancies. Instead, he enrolled Junius in the Virginia Military Institute nine months before Fort Sumter. Governor Hempstead didn't know at the time that cadets had sworn to protect Virginia against all of her enemies. The second most common motive was familial concerns, often related to loyalty to their birthplace or the birthplace of their father or mother. About half of the Iowa Confederates had this motive. Now to see this in context, let's look at some pie charts. 42% of the Iowa Confederates were born in the South, that is marked by gray, and 28% were born in the North, marked with blue. 21% were born in the Ohio Valley, marked with orange. The Ohio Valley could, have be, could be classified as either North or South, depending on the neighborhood. 9% of Iowa Confederates were born in a foreign country, marked with yellow. In the, next, in the next chart, birthplaces of Iowa Confederates are on top and birthplaces of parents are on the bottom. Fathers on the right, mothers on the left. A higher percentage of the parents were born in the South and a lower percentage of parents were born in the North. To repeat, about half of Iowa Confederates had a motive of familial concerns often related to loyalty to their birthplace or their mother's or father's birthplace. Let's consider an example. Virginia native John T. Lovell studied law at the University of Virginia. In the 1850s, Lovell called himself a son of Virginia 
He wrote, our state is soon destined as she ought to be the first state in the union. Virginia will be the bright particular star and rise superior to the rest, so mote it be. During the election of 1852, Lovell wrote, Mr. Fillmore is a lover of this invaluable union and is as true to Southern interest as the needle is to the pole. After he earned a law degree, he followed his older brother to Dubuque, Iowa, to make his fortune as a lawyer. Lovell was very successful, and he dipped his toe into local democratic politics as a stump speaker. When Lincoln was elected president, Lovell wrote, to my mind, Judge Douglas has contributed more to the election of Lincoln than all the black Republican orators together. I believe the South is right. However, and unless she can have equality and independence in the union, then she must and will have them out of it. I recognize in its broadest sense, the right of a state to secede. If a dissolution of the union comes, and I now think it probable, my destinies will be cast with the South, whose honor and interests I hold sacred and stand ready to sacrifice my life in defense of them. In July, 1861, a few months after Fort Sumter, Lovell showed his colors at an Independence Day celebration in nearby Zwingli, Iowa. He stated, no power on earth in heaven or hell could make me take up arms against my brethren in Virginia. Audience members silenced him. The Dubuque Weekly Times editor opined, we have some very bold rebels in this, in this county. Within a few months, Lovell returned to Virginia. We can see a different familial concern in the case of Albert H. Newell. Born in Tennessee, Albert's family moved to Iowa when he was a small child. Around the time of Fort Sumter, when Albert was 21, he moved to Tennessee to help his uncle run his lumber and flour mills. When Union troops moved into Tennessee the next year, Albert's two cousins enlisted in the Confederate Army, and so did he. A less common motive was philosophical, involving states' rights related to slavery and or an interpretation of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. About one third of Iowa Confederates had this motive. I'd like to pause and discuss the connection to slavery. 10 of the 76 Iowa Confederates had some connection to slavery as children or as adults. Eight of those 10 grew up in households that held one or more slaves in bondage for at least a short time. It's an amazing fact that one of those slave owning households was in Dubuque, Iowa. In the 1840 census of the free territory of Iowa, 11 residents held 17 human beings in bondage in Dubuque County. They were apparently freed after a couple of years. During the 1850s, one future Iowa Confederate moved south, married a Southern Belle, and bought two slaves. During the war, one Iowa Confederate received a slave as a gift, and another Iowa Confederate bought numerous slaves who were refugeed to Texas, away from the advancing Union troops. Philosophical motives seemed to depend on the chronology. James H. Williams was a Virginia native. His father was a slave owner and a Virginia state legislator who later helped lead the push for Virginia to secede. James himself believed that slavery benefited the enslaved, but we will see that his philosophical motive was not confined to the topic of slavery. James was a gifted lawyer who moved to Dubuque. Dubuque residents elected him to two terms in the Iowa General Assembly. After the war began, Iowa Governor Samuel J. Kirkwood called for Iowa volunteers and then a special legislative session. The session was to establish the legal framework for Iowa to enter the war and also provide the funding. James decided to oppose these efforts. He wrote in his diary, May 12th, 1861, started for Des Moines this morning. I go most reluctantly to the legislature want to be home to get ready to go to Virginia and espouse her cause. After the Iowa General, General Assembly convened, a bill came up to prevent rendering aid to rebels. James proposed an amendment requiring Iowans 
to support the Fugitive Slave Act. James's bill would have made it illegal to help fugitive slaves escape or avoid arrest. Many Republicans objected and the issue was tabled. Later, a bill came up to allow Union soldiers to vote in the field. James moved to postpone the bill until the year 2065. Some legislators called James a rank disunionist. Upon returning to Dubuque, James re-entered the fray in the editorial pages of the Dubuque Herald. He criticized President Lincoln for suspending the writ of habeas corpus. This meant that citizens could be arrested and jailed without a trial by jury. James said that suspending the writ violated the Constitution. A former Iowa congressman argued that the president had the power to suspend habeas corpus without congressional approval. James disagreed, stating, if it be disloyal to cry out against usurpation, wicked to complain of breaches of the Constitution, let us burn that sacred instrument and serenely recline our heads on the footstools of tyranny. Shortly before James returned to Virginia, he stated publicly, I have written nothing to favor violations of the Constitution in any quarter. I thought I had the right to call attention to un unconstitutional acts at home. It may be that no one has a right to question the acts of this government. The least common motive was feeling trapped, that is, feeling peer pressure to enlist or being conscripted. Before we leave the topic of motives, let us consider the political climate in the state of Iowa during the war. The political climate led to at least three Iowans leaving the state at risk of arrest, crossing into enemy lines and enlisting. While Union troops fought to crush the rebellion, Republicans back home waged a propaganda campaign against the Iowa Democratic Party. The Iowa Republican Party demonized peace Democrats as disloyal. Republicans also criticized Democrats who disagreed with any of Lincoln's strategies or who felt sympathy toward suffering Confederate civilians. These efforts created a tense, even precarious climate for, for those three Iowans who left the state and entered the Confederate service. The first case involves a prominent Iowan and his son. It requires a bit of background. Former U.S. Senator George Wallace Jones was a lifelong friend of Jefferson Davis, and they had served together in the U.S. Senate. When Senator Jones campaigned for re-election in the contentious 1850s, he said in stump speeches that he and his sons would be found in the ranks of the Southern Army in case of war. This remark may have been simply a politician's bravado. Jones lost his Senate seat due to his pro-slavery views. Jones's friend, President James Buchanan, appointed Jones minister to New Granada, present-day Columbia. Jones's eldest son, Charles S.D. Jones, remained at the family home in Dubuque. Everything changed with the next president, Lincoln. After Fort Sumter, Lincoln's Secretary of State, William H. Seward, began military arrests of civilians. Seward actually organized a secret service for this purpose. Seward began intercepting Ambassador George Wallace Jones's correspondence. Seward was looking for incriminating evidence of disloyalty. He got his wish. He found a May 17, 1861 letter from Jones to Confederate President Jefferson Davis. The Lincoln administration recalled Ambassador Jones and Seward ordered Ambassador Jones's arrest. Seward wasted no time announcing that Jones was in prison. Seward publicized Jones's May 17th letter to Jefferson Davis, highlighting passages that made Jones appear disloyal. Here is an excerpt from the letter. My prayers are regularly offered up for the reunion of the states and for the peace, concord, and happiness of my country. But let what may come to pass, you may rely upon it as you say that neither I nor mine will ever be found in the ranks of our, that is, your enemies. May God Almighty avert civil war, but if unhappily it shall come, you may, I think without doubt, count on me and mine and host of other friends standing shoulder to shoulder in the ranks with you and our other Southern friends and relatives whose rights, like my own, have been disregarded by the abolitionists. 
Many Republican editors said the evidence of Jones's disloyalty was clear and damning. However, Jones had clarified his thoughts in a different letter written the same day, which had slipped by the State Department. Great God, has it come to this that I am to be impressed into a Northern army at the bidding of Governor Kirkwood or other abolition cowards to go down south with a rifle on my shoulder to do battle against the only brother whom I have living or turn my back upon the state which has honored me so highly? Jones was never charged and he didn't receive a trial. His eldest son, Charles S.D. Jones, watched the U.S. government violate his father's civil liberties, and he read newspapers that excoriated his father. George Wallace Jones was released after two months in prison. Shortly after he returned home to Dubuque, his eldest son, Charles S.D. Jones, and Charles's wife, Annie, fled to Virginia. Charles made a beeline for Jefferson Davis's office, seeking a civil service job, and then a military appointment. Let's consider this second case, that of William V. Burton. It reflects the changing circumstances during the war. In 1862, when President Lincoln signed the Militia Act, it was effectively the nation's first conscription law. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton set up a national mechanism to suppress dissent against the war. For example, Stanton ordered chiefs of police of towns and cities across the country to arrest and imprison anyone who discouraged, discouraged volunteer enlistments by act, speech, or writing. Stanton then ordered the arrest of any draft eligible man between 18 and 45 who left his state without permission. William V. Burton wanted to get off the farm and go fight, according to his great granddaughter, but he didn't want to fight for the Union. On August 29th, 1862, Burton and a companion, Otto Dings, were enrolled for a future draft. They bolted for Missouri later that day. Burton enlisted in the Confederate Army a few months later. The third case involves John Flournoy Henry, a bank clerk who remained in Iowa while his heart was in the Confederacy. Illinois native John Flournoy Henry had attended Beloit College Prep School in Wisconsin and Cumberland College Law School in Tennessee. His father had been David Davis's physician. David Davis, you might recall, had conceived the brilliant strategy for making Abraham Lincoln the Republican nominee for president. But John Flournoy Henry also had friends and relatives in Tennessee. In fact, Fort Henry was later named for after his uncle. After the Civil War started, John F. Henry was in Burlington, Iowa, working in a bank. Burlington was a city on edge. The newspapers were abuzz with reports of known and suspected secessionists in Burlington. A Burlington Hawkeye editor said that rebel sympathizers should go where they belong to the rebel states. The editor doubted that any man known as a traitor could be safe. In 1862, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton issued his edicts to stifle dissent. Historian Hubert H. Wellman estimated that 36 Iowans were arrested in August 1862. This was the high water mark for arrests of Iowa civilians during the Civil War. John F. Henry had a dilemma because he said that his training, proclivities, and love of country were altogether in touch with Southern sentiment. All around him, public rhetoric heated up. Iowa Governor William M. Stone stated in his January 1863 inaugural address, there is no longer any middle ground where loyal men can stand. If treason is a crime, to sympathize with traitors is clearly criminal. Five months later, in June 1863, John, age 24, was enumerated for the draft. He felt harassed and worn out by the repeated calls for troops and the threatened drafts. John told his father, Dr. Henry, that he wanted to join his Tennessee friends and relatives in the Confederate Army. Dr. Henry advised against this move. John had few options. If he stayed in Burlington, he could be drafted. 
if he paid for a substitute, he would be putting another soldier in the Union Army. But if he left Iowa and law enforcement caught him, he could still be arrested and put in the Union Army. A month later, Burlington residents marked the Union victory at Vicksburg. They formed an exuberant nighttime procession with bells ringing, firecrackers exploding, and cannons firing. Afterwards, the Muscatine Journal said that rebel sympathizers should be compelled to leave, take the oath of allegiance, or be hanged. John finally left Iowa to take up arms in defense of his convictions. He apparently used the cover story of seeking a job in Philadelphia or Baltimore. He took a roundabout way of going from Iowa to the Confederacy. You'll notice that his route crossed the Potomac River from Maryland into Virginia with the help of smugglers, and it was a route approximately followed by that later on of Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth. Let's turn to the subject of captivity. Many Iowa Confederates were captured at least once, and many of those men spent time in captivity. POW camps were terrible on both sides, North and South. Some Iowa Confederates wanted to be released by taking the oath of allegiance to the US government. However, some Union commanders didn't allow Iowa Confederates to take the oath or they made the prisoners wait. For example, engineer William O'Day had left Iowa and gotten a railroad job in Mississippi. After the firing upon Fort Sumter, O'Day gave the following statement to Union authorities. I was born in Ireland. I am 26 years old. I enlisted with Captain John McGurk of the 17th Mississippi Infantry Company B and remained with him for the period of 17 months. My reason for enlisting was because I was out of employment. I belong to Iowa, and my father lives near West Union, Bremer County, Iowa. I had to leave home to obtain a living. I served 17 months in the Confederate Army against my consent. O'Day was moved to three different prisons. Eventually, he convinced Union officials to let him take the oath of allegiance to the US government. His Confederate company roll call listed him as a deserter. Imprisonment had the opposite effect on other Iowa Confederates. For example, captivity turned Junius L. Hempstead, eldest son of Iowa's second governor, into an ardent, lifelong, unrepentant Confederate and critic of the Union's POW camps. Let's turn to the subject of divided families. 19 men, that is 25% of Iowa Confederates had one or more immediate family members who served the Union. This figure seems more apt for a border state like Kentucky or Missouri. But as you, will, as you will recall, Iowa was a border state of the border state of Missouri. Let's consider desertions. In the pie chart, the largest, the largest uh, part of it is blue. 87% of Iowa Confederates did not desert. They remained in service. However, 11 Iowa Confederates, 14% deserted. You'll notice a discrepancy between 14% and the chart says 13%. So 14.4% of Iowa Confederates deserted. This figure is a little higher than 12.8% of Union troops who deserted, according to historian Ella Lon, who drew upon Thomas L. Livermore's estimates. And 14.4% desertion rate amongst Iowa Confederates is much higher than the overall Confederate desertion rate of 9.6%, citing Provost Marshal General James B. Fry's estimate. Nine of the 11 Iowa Confederates deserted in 1862 or 1863, but the other two deserted in April or May 1865 when many Confederate troops melted away. Two sets of brothers make up the largest number of Iowans who deserted. For example, the Talty brothers were natives of Ireland who moved to Davenport, Iowa in 1856. During the lingering panic of 1857, they moved to Memphis, Tennessee. All four brothers enlisted in Captain Bankhead's company Light Artillery in May 1861. About a year later, all four brothers 
deserted and went back to Davenport. Let's change the subject to casualty rates. You probably know the general rule of thumb that three times as many men died of disease during the war than died in battle. Iowa Confederates are an exception. The pie chart shows that deaths in battle, that is in the blue, and deaths from disease in the orange were about equal. The vast majority of Iowa Confederates were, did not die, they survived the war. Now let's consider post-war Iowa. Emotions were inflamed toward Iowa Confederates. For example, one Iowa woman whose husband was in Sherman's army believed it right and Christian-like to be eternally hostile to all rebels north and south. She wrote, I can never forget that they killed my brother Barton and now our dear old president. The time to be conciliatory is past. I am bitter, bitter. 66 Iowa Confederates survived the war. More than a third of them, that is 23, visited Iowa after the war. So on the pie chart, the pie chart, the yellow represents those who never returned. The blue, the orange, and the gray represent Iowa Confederates who visited Iowa after the war. Half of that group remained in Iowa for the rest of their lives. One or two of them held appointed offices in the state, and two were elected to municipal offices. Confederate service sometimes became a post-war campaign issue, a very heated one at that. One Iowa community refused to bury an Iowa Confederate in the local cemetery saying, not in our hallowed ground. Thank you for watching my presentation. If you have an autographed copy of my book, please send a check for $31.94 to the address that you see on the screen. Thank you very much.